so Lord Diltari has a subscribe star also known as the Paladin. I would really recommend anyone who's invested in this story to go over and check it out. It's a solid way to help support the author and help get stories like this written. So check out the top link in the description. Though let's start will we? Be me. Be for thing about on Reddit. User SLDF45 mentions that I haven't posted what these guys actually look like aside from a mildly amusing series of percentile die rolls. A, I've got I'm and general character descriptions let's do this thing. First, Castor, the current reader favorite. Gaz is by far the largest member of the party, an utterly massive figure standing 8 feet tall and weighing 300 pounds, almost all muscle. His scales are all various shades of red darkest like dried blood around his chest, neck, and back, lighter burgundy on his limbs and face, and lightest of all on his palms, which are light pink, he is almost always wearing his armor, a finely crafted set of dwarven mail, while the armor is statistically chain mail, it actually includes sections of solid plate on his shoulders, forearms, upper chest, and thighs, the breeze plate is the symbol of Klangdeen, two crossed axes, engraved in a very thin layer of mitral on it, which makes it both the most visibly striking and durable part of the entire suit. Regarding his actual axes, those are always at his side, hanging at his belt alongside a warhammer. While none of them are actually silvered, Kazdor keeps such magnificent care of them that they appear to be. Also interesting to note is that because they are dwarven weapons, they are entirely made out of metal with neither leather nor wood for a handle, and they are a single unit, the axe and handle forged together from the same piece of metal. On the rare occasions he's out of his armor, he's found in a plain brown tunic and occasionally a blacksmith's apron when he's busy maintaining the party equipment. He never wears a helmet, mostly due to one of his more striking physical features, a prominent pair of red fin-like crests that sweep from just above his eyes to back above his head. In a manner very similar to his red dragon ancestors, he is actually rather handsome by human or dwarven standards with a firm jawline and strong cheekbones and facial structure. His face is permanently dour, neither smiling nor scowling, not that many can tell the difference. His eyes stand out a great deal from his head, being pools of brilliant icy sapphires with vertical slits that seem to pierce right through whomever falls beneath his gaze. Next, Undri, our elven beauty and apparently the most popular paladin to ship at the moment. Undri is once again rather tall, standing at an Amazonian 6 foot 3 inches, but lied to the point of seeming slight to those who have not seen her in motion. I strongly suspect there will be at least one anvil comment made by Kaz towards her at some point. Her skin is very pale, enough that a foolish person might mistake her for a vampire, for it actually glows in the night when light strikes her. Even more evanescent is her hair, which is whiter than snow and something of a rarity, flowing from her crown all the way down to below her ribs. It has been this way since birth, making other elves see her as far older than she actually is. She has slightly triangular features, making her appear clever first and beautiful second. Her eyes are a remarkable amethyst color, the same shade both in normal light and dark vision. It is difficult to tell whether Andri is ever in armor or not as she wears her silver chain beneath her tunic, a long pure white garment that flows from her shoulders down to the tops of her tall leather boots, one of which always has a dagger hidden in it. She wears leather gloves made from wolfskin. At her right hip she wears a quiver where she keeps her arrows, most of which are simply steel, but she does also carry a few legitimately silvered pieces, just in case. At her right rests her saber, an elegant but simple weapon with a hilt of living wood that still grows leaves to serve as wrapping. However, her primary weapon is her bow, serving both as her preferred tool and symbol of office. The entire thing is pure white, you from which all the bark has been stripped and strung with spider's thread, a symbol of the legendary moonbow which is the sign of Spladen. Next, the halfing knight of Avery, peregrine horse rider. Peregrine is of average height for a halfling, but actually lighter than normal, mostly owing to the fact that his gut is almost worryingly small by halfling standards. Despite his diminutive stature he is the most visibly toned of the entire party. His eyes are a shining hazel, twinkling with life and laughter in most circumstances, even during combat. However, when his wrath is roused, they gleam with killing intent, great and terrible focus that can make even the smallest of warriors terrifying. He has a rounded, 
pleasant face much wrinkled with laughter lines and the beginnings of age. At 40 years old, he is perhaps slightly past his prime physically, but that isn't stopping him. He is always the first out of his armor at the end of the day, and prefers to dress in green and gold, with a particular fondness for a tall chef's hat that might have been white once, but is now a tapestry of many stains. Even in battle he does not wear shoes, but instead goes barefoot, or as bare as any feet that hairy can go. His hair is dark brown with a touch of gray and extremely curly. In battle, he normally keeps it under an iron skull cap that also guards the sides of his face, but has no visor. His male shirt is plain, carefully maintained, but purely functional. Although it has been gaining more of a shine since Castor has taken over maintenance, he wears a black tabard over it with the crossed blades of Avery upon it, but his hip are his distinctive bone-hilted short swords, though what bone makes up their hilt seems to change with every telling. Sometimes they are simply cow bones, other times whale bone, and occasionally they are even the two halves of a great woolly mammoth tusk. Ask him about these discrepancies and he'll tell you that every story changes a little to teach the lesson it needs to. On the topic of people actually wearing helmets, Sir Buckethead turned himself. Even when it's not stuck, Julian generally prefers to wear his helmet, which is a standard Templar Bucket helm, highly useful in defense and generation of nicknames, although it's a bit of a tight fit at the best of time. Underneath it, he looks very young, almost like a teenager with a thin, fair, a youthful face. He is not particularly good looking, bordering on plain, and when he wears his spectacles, a simple pair of iron and glass, he looks more like a scholar than a warrior. His skin is a deep pearl green, and his hair color is unknown as he shaves his head and beard bald. His eyes are entirely devoid of pupils and are orbs of faintly glowing indigo. He is fairly tall and actually quite imposing in his full armor, standing at six feet but not necessarily when standing next to his companions, that is until he reveals the full glory of his divine heritage. His wings are massive, feathered beacons gleaming with ivory light, their full wingspan twice as long as he is tall, in flight he is magnificent, the very picture of a righteous hero. Julian's armor is practical and somewhat unremarkable, save for the fact that it is an angelic, holy white. He wears a tabard of similar shade but it bears no marking. He would appear at first to be any other wandering freelance if not for his sword. While it bears neither magical properties nor a special name, it is visually impressive enough that an uneducated onlooker would mistake it for one of the legendary Holy Avengers. The blade is purest white and gleams in the light, save for the blood channel which glints crimson. For a cross guard it bears a golden aquila, the outstretched wings emerging from a garnet which serves as the center from which reaches down a broad handle large enough for both hands, wrapped in black leather. From whence he obtained the weapon is not entirely known, but what is known is that it is a replica of the blade still wielded by his father. And last but not least is the infernal beauty, Senkid, daughter of Zarathustra. In any age there are women of legendary and magnificent beauty, Senkid is one of those women, a face to rival even mythic Helen. If one were to create the very ideal of seductive beauty, Senkit would be closer than almost any mortal, assuming you ignore the more diabolical features. Her eyes are pools of solid gleaming gold that glow brighter when she becomes excited. Her skin is a warm dark red like cooling embers in a fire, and her hair is raven black, though kept short, only down to her neck, her infernal bloodline is undeniable, with black horns emerging from just behind and above her ears, curved backwards. In addition she does have a tail, unforked, but thicker and more muscular than most teal things. Muscular is also a good word to describe her build as a whole. Despite standing only 5 foot 9, she is well built enough that she seems larger than any other party member save Kazdor. Her last physical trait of note is her feet, which are in fact cloven hooves. Someone looking at her equipment might think that she is attempting to leverage her beauty in battle. Said person would receive Senkit's fist directly to their face. As a native of Chalt, Senkit's armor is designed for tropical conditions, meaning it is built to keep the wearer cool, not modest. While once again statistically identical to chainmail, it actually includes no chain at all, instead of being made up of limited areas of plate. Anyone mistaking exposed skin for a weak point will be sorely disappointed though, as Senkit's experience using this army makes her the best defended member of the party. Also contributing to this iron defense is her shield. 
a large kite variant with a flaming sword, the symbol of her order, upon it. Of course, any good defense also includes a solid offense, and for that sake it relies upon her morning star. There is nothing even remotely fancy about this weapon, it seems entirely standard, and one gets the feeling this is probably not the first ball of spikes on a shaft that she's wound up using. Senkit is far too practical a woman to ever acquire a tool that becomes too precious to throw away if the situation calls for it. Be me, pallid, be not me, because door the crimson, Andre the pale, Senkit Zarathustra the also red, Peregrine the slightly tan, Julian the vaguely sea green, and the ought the confused as to why skin tones are being used as titles. Having enjoyed a lovely feast and acquired their new mounts, all hail Warpig, they rise swiftly. Peregrine on his golden retriever following hidden halfling paths back to the main road. Once back on the main road, Andri slips off into the woods and rides ahead, her elk easily passing through the woods slightly more stealthily. After riding hard until the sun begins to set, she comes upon a small chapel surrounded by a graveyard. She returns to the main group and they decide to spend the night in the abandoned place. Pushing open the old darn gate, they walk through an overgrown gravel path to the large open doors past dozens of graves overgrown with ivy. Names and headstones worn away by wind and rain and simple time. The old doors creak as Kazdor pushes them open. Despite their advanced age they are still sturdy. Inside, the stone floor is still clear of foliage, though the wooden pews have long since rotted almost altogether. The altar and the pulpit, graven from stone, still stand largely unblemished. Although any sacred icons have vanished, leaving no trace of whatever god once held sway here. A certain degree of argument arises as to what god they should rededicate the chapel to. Kazdor obviously argues for Muradin, while Andri argues that its position in the middle of a graveyard means it should be dedicated to Selhadin. Peregrine abstains, stating that the chapel was clearly built by humans, and so it's probably a human god. What are ye two? Kazdor asks Senkit and Julian, who are busy setting out bedrolls. I've no particular allegiance to any deity. With all the graves it might be practical to give it to Pella. Julian states pragmatically as he begins to check the windows to make sure they don't open. You're a paladin who doesn't serve any gods, Senkit says curiously. I don't see any holy symbols on you either. My order is dedicated to the seven heavens as a whole, since we've got all sorts in it. The closest thing we have to a patron is the Archangel Zeriel. Considering we don't know who's buried here, I say we dedicate it to the heavens undivided. After a small amount of grumbling Kazdor concedes, as does Andri, although only on the condition that they build a small shrine to sell Hayden in the nearby woods before they leave. Senkit conducts the ceremony, laying seven small piles of golden coins upon the altar to represent the seven mountains of the heavens, then sprinkling holy water atop them to consecrate the chapel once more. With that business done as best they can, the paladins attend to their more mundane business of cooking food and repairing their equipment. Julian pulls out the tome with herbal in it and then pulls out a second, far older leather-bound book. He reaches into his bag and pulls out a pair of spectacles, an inkwell, and a quill. He begins to copy the ritual from one book into another. Peregrine looks over curiously. What's that? A family heirloom. Do not distract me, the copy must be perfect to work properly. Kazdor finishes sharpening his axes around at the same time that Julian sets down the book to let the ink dry. If you've been a wizard the entire time, we could have used some fireballs yesterday. Not a wizard, I simply picked up a few tricks of my mother's trade. That, and one of her old ritual books. Your mother was a witch? Senkit asks curiously. Conjurer, that's how she met my father. Sounds like there's a story there. Probably but she never told me it. All I know is that she was in sigil at the time, because she stayed there until I was five. Ape, so you need from this plane? Ye are Simmer did he do anything this strange? I suppose if you're a conjurer it's the place to be. I mostly take after my father, but I do remember how to do a few tricks. He says as he raises his hand above the spellbook and begins to chant. A few moments later, a freshly baked loaf of bread crackles into existence in his hand. Senkit raises an eyebrow. All hail the arch margos of bread. She says sarcastically, none for you then. Julian says as he breaks it and digs in. A meal of jerky, dried fruit and freshly summoned bread is eaten and the party beds down for the night after Kazdor bars the door. 
when the witching hour comes, and the moon is gone beneath the horizon and the stars hide in the clouds, the claim of light is challenged, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, the paladins awaken at the sound of a hideous heartbeat, they raise their heads in confusion and unry, sank it, and the orcs hearts turn to ice, the chapel is infested with the writhing pulsing black vines, crawling down the walls and pushing up from between the stones beneath, growing from the edge of sight into plain view with horrid speed and vigor. Arise, evil is upon us, Senkit calls as she rises to her feet and seizes her mace. Her armor has been set aside, and with no time to don it, seizes her shield and prepares to do battle in a night shirt. Andre and Peregrine quickly pull on their chain shirts, it isn't comfortable, but at least they can get it on. Julian looks around, still unable to see the vines. He calls upon light and his grey sword gleams against the darkness, allowing Peregrine and Kasdor to see the vines. What in the nine hells are those? Sen, I think he messed up the consecration. Yort notices Kasdor is still wearing his armor. Wait, you sleep in that? Only when I am sleeping near a hobgoblin. Yort's reply is cut off by the sound of pounding on the door and breaking glass as a dozen skeletons, held together by the pulsing black vines leap through the windows. Hammer time then laddies. Kazdor warns as he swaps an axe for the warhammer he took from the watchtower and charges, scattering bones and rusted weaponry with furious blows. Andri draws her blades from hip and boot and charges. Swift silver slashes sever spine and tendon alike, undoing the fabric holding the bone warriors together. Julian lifts his head to the forgotten chandelier hanging from the roof and lights it once more, illuminating the chapel in the pale indigo of magic. Peregrine takes his sling and loses twice into the skeletons near the back, cracking apart the pelvis and leaving the unfortunate undeared crawling. Undaunted by her lack of armor, Senkit rushes down a trio of skeleton, her shield crushes one against the wall, while her mace breaks through old bones with contemptuous ease. Lubbed up, lubbed up. The fell beat commands as the surviving skeletons fall upon the paladins, Andri's hastily domed mail turns aside a rusted blade, but Senkit is far less lucky, knives slip past her guard and gouge chunks of flesh from her breast and shoulder. Lubbed up, crash, the door breaks from its hinges as fresher corpses, zombies, batter it down and mob into the cathedral. That might be a problem, Julian observes, a knee laddie. Remember, Kazdor assures and shouts a dwarven phrase, he is answered by a roaring squeal as his boar charges into the back lines of the zombies, laying into the undying mass with tusk and sheer bulk, war pig, Andri rushes to aid of her friend, flowing like water around the skeleton, delivering a smite to it as she passes that cleaves it in twain before she delivers her dagger and saber to the backs of the undeared warriors, twisting her wrists to pop the vertebrae apart and crumble them, you alright, I've been better, but I'll live, come on. The dauntless stifling assures as she drives once more into the breach, smashing apart zombies like revolting binyards. Blades flash and zombies fall at the knee as Peregrim dances through the horde, leaving crawling corpses in his wake. War pig. Julian smiles as he throws himself into the fray, his mighty blade cleaving through two zombies with a single swipe before he draws back and drives it into an unbeating heart. Lubbed up. Lubbed up. The unseen heart still beats, and drives the undead on. The zombie Julian so expertly speared walks itself up the spear and slams him in the face, throwing the Asima back, uncaring that the blade rips it apart as it leaves. The continuing horde fall upon the war boar, beating it down and ripping chunks of flesh from its body. Peregrine gets a taste of his own medicine as the crawling zombies batter him at the knees. All o ye, fall back. Kazdor orders as he moves forwards, fire in his jaws. Andri's bath rums twice and two zombies become half as perceptive, stumbling back. Julian leaps to his feet, smashing his head into the zombie who dared to survive getting run through, dropping it with a ferocious headbutt before hopping back. Senkit breaks a zombie in half, curbs stomps its head, and then bashes another into the main horde. Peregrine cuts the arms from the owners grasping him and rolls away. The undying limbs still holding his anklets in a death grip. Party clear, Kazdor lets fly, turning the front of the church into a pyre, as his war pig rends aside the last few. Julian breathes a sigh of relief before that hideous heart beats again. From the shadows of the vines humanoid shapes appear, whirling along the walls and ceiling. Oh come on. The party regroups, lending healing touches to one another and standing close to brace for the assault. 
Senkit on the other hand marches past the vines to the pulpit, exceedingly irritated at the presence of Antir in her chapel. She calls upon that power divine and speaks, her golden eyes gleam with light, as a halo of flames dance along her horns. At her back a corona of crimson flame appears not unlike wings, her voice is great and terrible, the force of holy wrath behind it, hear me O spirits and obey, thou art dead, and to death thou shalt return, trouble no more the living, and surrender thy arrogant grasp on Unlif, lest ye be cast into that pit, Barata, where the worm does not die and the fire does not go out, the shadows, apparently impressed by her brimstone sermon, turn and fled into the night. Nothing like a tiffling to bring hell fire and brimstone. Peregrine jokes, and Senkit smiles before the beat sounds again. Lub dub lub dub, lub dub. The beat roars through the chapel and the writhing vines constrict, cracking stones and walls. Julian's eyebrows shoot up as he gets a general idea of what he isn't seeing. Andre's keen ears hear more than most though, and she can tell from whence the beat comes. It's coming from below. She shouts as warning before skeletal hands punch through the floor, as the dead beneath the chapel rise, clawing forth around the party. Somewhat ironically clad in rotting priestly vestment, Kazdor wastes no time in bringing the hammer down by, well, bringing the hammer down. Andri pulls out her swords once more and drives them into the emerging evil. Skeleton priests, seems like a bad joke, Peregrine is actually secretly somewhat happy, as the enemy is on his level for the moment. He lays into them with fervor and fury, snapping skulls from spines. Julian raises his sword to execute the undead again, but stops and shouts a warning to Senkit as a spectral figure rises behind her. Senkit turns and raises her shield to block, but the wraith cares not, plunging its arm through her shield, arm, and chest. The paladin turns from red to slightly pink, frost forming on her lips and her morning star sinking to the floor, arm too weak to lift it as the hungry ghost grasps phantom fingers around her heart. Gasping for breath, her fingers grasp weakly on the handle of her mace before she grits her teeth and smashes it through the wraith's head. Its shadowy body swirls around the weapon like smoke, but it is forced to glide back, releasing its grip on her heart. Sank it sucks in a breath and blows out a curse, morning star blazing with hellfire as she brings it towards the spirit's head. The wraith raises its arm and blocks the blow. A sound like a thunderclap rings through the chapel as black arcana and orange fire ripple out from the impact site. Castor leaves the emerging undead and moves towards the wraith, switching back to two axes. Douglasi, ye deal with the skeletons, I'll handle this one. Andri draws forth two of the enchanted arrows she was gifted and fires. The wraith reels back as the first arrow lodges in its chest and sticks there. It raises a hand as if to block the next, but the blessed projectile simply rips through, momentarily obliterating the shadowy limb. The creature's pale eyes go wide in shock and horror. The desecrated priests conclude their emergence and drive the paladins back. Rusted maces open several gashes on Julian's chest and back. The Arsimer shifts his grip on the Grey Sword and whirls it in a great arc, smashing back both corpses with tremendous force. Despite the grievous blow, they do not crumble. Peregrine parries his dead priest's mace and strikes the hand off at the wrist. He cuts away a knee, forcing it to kneel and delivers a third slash to its clavicle, only to have to leap back as the abomination grabs its mace in its other hand and swipes at him. Senkit rages at the mighty wraith as she hears another priest clack behind her. She ducks under both their strikes and swipes the skeleton's legs out from under it. She catches it under the ribs as she rises and delivers it over her head, smashing its entire upper body into dust against the pulpit. Kazdor hurtles at the altar, shrugging off a blow to his head as he hurtles last a priest. He leaps over the pulpit. The wraith watches him disinterestedly until his right axe swings into its stomach and actually connects. The creature hisses in confusion as it raises an arm to block the offhand swing. Ye spooky skinners can ye handle holy symbols can ye? Well, did ye ken me axes a me holy symbol? He laughs as he rips out his axe and delivers it with a smite to boot directly into the wraith's chest, hurling it back into the altar, where it spasms like a fish on an electric fence before sinking into the ground. Andri dodges under another swipe from the priest attacking her, pulling another silver arrow from her quiver she drives it into the creature's forehead, just die already. She curses as she channels a smite, blasting the skeleton's skull to oblivion. 
She turns and necks the arrow to her bow and fires it into one of the priests attacking Julian, where it vanishes in a shower of silver and bone. The surviving priest strikes at Julian, but he counters with enough force to send the old mace flying across the church. He steps forwards and pulverizes the undead with a blow echoed by a sudden throb of red energy. The soul skeleton remaining smashes the ground in front of Peregrine, who runs up the mace and the arm holding it, delivering a cross slash that splits the grinning skull in four. He lands, smiling confidently, lubbed up. Peregrine's smile fades as every hair on his body stands on end. But before he can move, or even scream, the black fog of the wraith erupts from beneath him, completely covering and smothering the halfling. A clatterings out through the silent chapel as two bone-hilted short swords fall to the ground. In an instant, the building rings with the sound of commands, be gone, release, retreat, flee. The wraith sways, but does not move, cruel laughter echoes from the dark before stopping for a moment as cracks of golden light, the light of healing magic, spread across its body. The heartbeat thuds like a stampede as life and anti-life mix. Despite the creature's best attempt to flee, there is a blinding white, and the roaring of wind, then an explosion of golden light erupts from the altar. The vines scream into black smoke before the consecrated power, no more suppressed. When the paladins clear their eyes of the glare, they see Peregrine lying in a crater, a grin on his face. Blessings of Avery upon you, he says, then grimaces. Also, oh, I do not recommend blowing up a wraith while still inside it, that is very painful. The party laughs in relief, then suddenly realizes they have no idea where the ought is. The hobgoblin soon crawls in, badly battered. Next time, I'm sleeping as far away as possible from any and all windows. He grumbles before passing out in the center of the church. Realizing their own extreme tiredness, the paladins follow suit. When they awaken, noontime sun is shining down on the pile of adventurers plus one snoring war pig. Be me. Pallad, be not me, be Kazdor, Senkit, Julian, Peregrine, and Undri, paladins of the Summer Lands. After rousing themselves after a long night of undead smiting, the party sets about getting ready to move out, slowing somewhat in their departure as they pause for a couple hours to construct a small shrine to Sladen Moonbow in the woods outside their newly reconsecrated chapel. Thanks to their late start, they don't make it far before dark begins to fall again. They make camp and the Oort reports that they are now only a few miles from the Abbey. After some debate, Senkit and Dundry set out into the night to scout the location. After about an hour, they arrive. The Abbey is indeed an impressive structure that almost resembles a castle more than a place of worship. A huge wall, 20 feet tall, surrounds a sizable area, in which they can see one main building with a tall bell tower, several floors, and multiple wings. This abbey could probably hold the majority of the colonizing force by itself, and with its strong fortifications, taking it will prove difficult. After some deliberation, the pair sneaks closer to the walls, which still glow faintly red even in the infrared dark vision. They are indeed warm to the touch. They spy guards walking in patrol, and once one passes, they race to the edge of the wall. With a boost from Senkit, Andre leaps, her fingers just catching the lip of the parapet, fully extended above her head. She pulls herself up just enough to peer over the walls. The walls are thick enough for two men to walk abreast with no discomfort, and there is only a single gate, a huge oaken thing reinforced with steel. Inside the walls is a lake, an orchard, and enough space that a ramshackle goblin camp has been built. Through a window she can spy a hobgoblin walking by inside, it seems they've reserved that part of the place for themselves. She runs the numbers and estimates the size of the main building, then drops back down. Senkit watches the walls carefully, until she sees a light above the gate. She peers closer and sees the flaming ghost of a Tiffling, clad in full plate and bearing a brilliant sword. He looks to her and then points towards the abbey. I am the heart of fire in stone. I am the story unforgotten. I am victory over the darkness. Seek my bed. Restore us, air of fire. It commands, then fades. Andri drops from the wall next to Senkit, startling her from her reverie. Did you see him? The startled Tiffling demands. See who? Is there a commander? No, the ghost. The flaming Tiffling. Nothing ghostly and nothing flammable. She says with a shake of her head. Pits. Senkit curses softly as they retreat back into the dark woods. 
As they move from the abbey, they make the startling realization that it, and everywhere within a few meters of it, are totally free of the black vines. They share a world that's worth investigating later. Look and slink back to the encampment. Back at their hidden camp, the paladins discuss the situation worriedly. If the measures you've given me are accurate, assuming Doe built it, and that's a fair guess with those walls and that gate, and taking into account both Scoffin halls in a primary worship center, we're looking at around 200 to 500 hobs, knee count in the Groby camp, which could have just as many if ne more. With those walls and those numbers, we can need just charge in and take it, that'd be suicide. Kaz Dor says grimly as he observes the rough map and redraw of the abbey. Even if we single quote AD the numbers for it, I'd need challenge this place with an army. It's built like a bloody castle and has both water and food, probably with an unknown amount of stores. Even in a siege this place would be bloody tartic. We need an advantage of some sneaky or seriously magical kind. I strongly doubt the abbey building is full to capacity. Julian says, hobgoblins are intensely hierarchical. A horde this size will have probably a single commander for every 10 men or so, and while the grunts might bunk together, any commander will probably have their own private room. And the warlord probably has an entire suite for status symbols. If the abbey was full, they'd have built more hob quarters inside and forced the goblins out. What about the goblins? Peregrine asks. Hordes usually treat them the absolute worst, and this time's no different. Maybe we could convince them to rebel? That would require trusting goblins to work with us, Senkit says with a snort. Not necessarily, if we get them to fight, odds are whoever comes out on top of this will be fairly badly weakened. Then we can strike, Julian points out. Nee, it'd be a one-sided slaughter. The hobs are bigger, stronger, and far better equipped. Besides, the Groby would need be able to work together as a whole without a leader nasty enough that we'd need want to arise. What about poison? We know what they're using for a water source, we could poison the dang weak and the entire horde. Andre observes, pointing to the lake. Two major problems, first we'd need a lot of poison, and we'd need to find a way to purify that lake again if we mean to hold this place. Which is also going to require that we get the colonists here, which is just another problem no matter how we do it. Julianne advises, pondering the map. What we really need is more information, especially about the inside. Here's the thought, we find their commanders, assassinate them, and then funnel their forces into a killing zone. If we can bottleneck them, we nullify the numbers advantage, and while I don't fancy the idea of how long we'd have to fight to wipe out a hundred hobgoblin, we're more than a match for them if they can't come at us more than one or two at a time. As entertaining as the idea of slaughtering an entire army is, that's an extremely risky plan. I doubt their commanders will be so easily dealt with especially if they're spread out. Even getting to them would require infiltrating the place, which is a problem in and of itself. Sen points out, we're attacking too many problems at once. Peregrine observes, let's lay them out and solve each in turn. They have three major advantages. They're occupying a very strong defensive position. They have a serious numerical advantage, and they know the inside of the abbey. However they have two major disadvantages, their forces are divided between the goblins and the hobs, and the hobs are highly reliant on an intact command and control structure. We have the advantage of surprise and superior combat ability on a per soldier basis. What do we do with this? Let's start with the defenses. From what we can gather they have three major defensive lines. There are the walls themselves, which we could probably climb, although doing that quietly is going to be a problem. Next is the goblin camp. If we go stealthily then this is a massive moray of possible alarms, and if combat breaks out here then we're probably dead. Last is the abbey itself, which we don't know anything about. Not a pretty picture, Julian says, pointing at each section. The walls can be climbed relatively stealthily, but they have guards more or less constantly. Senkit points out, getting anyone besides Andri and Pagrinova without setting off the alarm isn't going to happen. What about here, at the gatehouse? Julian says as he points it out. If Andre and Peregrine can kill the guards there quickly enough, we could slip open the gate and get inside before anyone notices. Of course then we're on a timer until they change the gatekeepers out. That could work, but then we've the wee problem of a hundred or more groby to sneak by. Exactly, but those goblins could be the solution to all our problems. Peregrine points out. If we can get them on our side, or at least enough of them, 
they could be away inside the abbey, and a valuable source of information. How exactly are ye gonna get them on side laddie? You're a fine speaker but ye can ye simply wander in and say hello there, ye feel like an uprising. Even assuming they didn't kill ye, the obs most certainly will. I go in disguise, I'm the same size as a goblin and speak it to boot, so if we were to disguise me like one of, say, the wolf riders we killed back at the watchtower and ride in with a warning about Mac Tower's fall, I could get in. That could work. It might even bait them into sending forces away to try to retake the tower, which could be an opportunity to strike at some of their forces and reduce their number. Julian says, visibly brightening at the idea. You're carrying around a book of magical rituals, Andre points out, and you need to be able to disguise yourself any time you had to take off that helmet of yours wouldn't you? While I appreciate the confidence, there's a couple of problems with that particular spell, which is why I keep the aforementioned helmet on. Namely, it only lasts an hour, good if you need to make a quick meeting with a potential employer or prevent rumors from popping up in an inn, but not good for long-term infiltration. Huh? I suppose the stories about Faye being able to hide themselves permanently were just stories then. Andre says, sounding slightly disappointed. They probably could, but that's because they're essentially made out of magic, and while I've got my suspicions about why exactly this place is constantly summer, looking for fairy backup is probably foolish, Julian responds, that being said I could potentially be the infiltrator, the party stares at him for a moment, I can cast that spell as many times as I like, I just need 10 minutes to do it, I could disguise myself as a hobgoblin and sneak inside, if I lose my disguise I'm also the most likely to escape considering I can just fly out. I can identify the commanders and get the layout of the interior. The Yi can grow be though. Kazdor says, and the frown on Julian's face tells him that he's poked a hole in the otherwise rather clever plan. Disguise is still the best idea for information gathering we've got thus far, and it might even let us deal with their numbers somewhat. It's risky, but I say we try it, Senkit says. But just in case, I say we introduce the disguise to one of their scouting parties first to see if it will fool them. What am I, chopped liver? Yort, who has been waiting for one of them to notice him for some time. The paladins turn quickly, and peregrine fassy palms, you know. I really should have thought of that sooner. Are ye mad laddie? Trusting him tainy betray us? When Andre grows a beard, he exclaims, Hold Castor, let's see the truth of the matter, Senkit says before invoking a zone of truth. Will you betray us if we send you on this mission? No. I want to see the warlord dead, his war host broken, and everything he ever accomplished and done. Those are harsh words, why? Peregrine asks. It might have to do with the fact that he refused to support my legion in holding Zanjonas against the orcs. Or maybe it's the fact that he didn't warn us about the old horde he baited into us while we retreated. Or maybe it's the fact that the coward only attacked us after he'd made the savages do his dirty work for him, or maybe it's the fact that he killed my father, stripped me of my command, press ganged me into his legion, and expected me to fucking thank him for it. I honestly don't know what part of that most makes me want to personally haul the bastard into the deepest pit in hell and feed his balls to a man decor. He says, emotion and voice building until he's practically shouting by the end of it. The party realizes that maybe they should have asked him about this before now, but considering he was either hiding or getting boned by a sudden skeleton ambush during every major encounter since he showed up, maybe I should have done a better job reminding them that he did in fact exist. Oh well, live and learn I suppose. With this in mind, his backstory persuades them that they can probably trust him at least somewhat, and even Kazdor grudgingly admits this. As the party bends down, a plan at least in mind, Kazdor pulls the ought aside. Listen well laddie, I'm only gonna say this once, but I was wrong about ye? He says, and the act seems to pain him. He tosses a bag at the hobgoblin. Ye gonna need your equipment. As the hobgoblin takes up his sword and shield again, Kazdor draws his axes. Ye are out of practice, come at me. The ought hesitates for a moment, and then nods. The two warriors circle one another, restrained slashes and parries ring out in the night. Yort's style is cautious, but his shield work is impeccable, each time stopping the oncoming axes no matter what angle it comes from. His swordsmanship leaves something to be desired though, as he is unable to even touch Kazdor's armor. 
The pair go back and forth a few rounds before Niort gets a singularly lucky moment, slipping past Kazdor's defenses with a clever feint and halting his blade mere inches from the Dragonborn's throat. He steps back and settles into his defensive position again. Kazdor finally starts taking the fight seriously and stops holding back. A rain of axes hammer down the hobgoblin's defenses and the Oort leaps back from a silver blade that swipes just in front of his head. Good reflexes there laddie, and good shield work too. Something I noticed about it though. What? That it does a good job of falling over? Nee. You're used to using it more to protect your comrades than yourself aren't ye? It's bloody close to something we use it in tunnel fighting. Yort nods, unsure where Kazdor is going with this. Ye might actually prove me more wrong than I thought laddie. Kazdor says as he puts away his axes, ending the sparing session. Ye say ye want revenge for Yada and your friends. Ard where ye to think on what ye'd do after that. A man who fights for his comrades or for himself might be the type who'd fight for others' vengeance as well. So I've recently moved Nick Badia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!